Yo, yo, yo. What's up, guys? It's your boy Player X here with the Semi Limited Podcast. Just want to thank everybody for tuning in and listening and supporting the podcast as they usually do, whether it be on social media, whether you're sharing the podcast itself, maybe interacting with the pages, everything you guys do, no matter how small, is very big to us. So we appreciate it and we want to show the love back to you guys. So before we get into today's episode, because we have a bunch of things to talk about and we also have guests to bring onto the podcast this week. Uh, be sure to go down to that link tree link down below in the description box. You can click on that link. It'll bring you to a tab with all of our social sites on there. You're going to follow all of our sites. You're going to follow the Facebook. You're going to follow the YouTube, the Twitter, or X, or whatever the fuck you want to call it. You're going to follow the Instagram. All that shit is all down there for you. So click on it and make sure you're following all of those sites. There will be another giveaway as we just got done get, doing a giveaway at 50 YouTube subscribers. There'll be another giveaway when we hit 50 followers on X, which we're pretty damn close to. We just need like two more, so fucking follow. Uh, And TikTok. And then also when we hit 100 uh, followers on IG and 100 subscribers on YouTube, we'll be doing more giveaways. So if you guys like uh, Yu-Gi-Oh accessories, maybe a play set of cards, some merchandise from the podcast, you'll never know what it's going to be. I'm I'm trying to bring a couple new things as far as merchandise and onto the platform for you guys as well uh, with a couple suggestions from viewers like you guys, but... You guys know what the deal is. We'll give away something for you guys. Don't even worry about it. If you have a suggestion, feel free to drop it on any of those social sites that you're following because that's why you follow us, right? Also, shout out to our sponsors, Unplugged Gaming and Manliest New York for sponsoring the podcast. Uh, Be sure to go join their Discord server in the description box below to be a part of their TCG communities, whether it be Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon, Magic, The Gathering, all the trifectas, the new stuff like Lorcana, One Piece, any of that new stuff, be sure to go down there and find a community that you click with and click into it. You can go play something new, a new game. You can go into the store and be sure to see Joe and tell them that the boys over at Semi Limited sent you and he'll always be sure to hook you guys up. Also, before we get into the episode, our last announcement is make Make sure to catch Brad, aka Mr. Perfect, uh, live streaming on Twitch every Saturday night at 11 p.m. Eastern Central Time. Uh, that'll be 11 p.m. for anyone in the East Coast of the United States or whatever time zone it is from there from you. Uh, his, Twitch, his Twitch link will also be in our link tree link down below, so you can make sure to click that and tune in. Uh, he streams at 11 p.m. at night, so until about 1 o'clock in the morning, usually doing things like deck profiles, play testing, deck theories, uh, stuff like that. And if you be sure to interact with him, anything that's notable that happens on stream, guys, goes right back into the podcast on a Friday night wrap up so be sure to go down there interact with him on those saturday night live streams and then be sure to follow his twitch channel and uh subscribe to all the goodness down there but getting into today's episode because we got a lot we got about as far as like the cancun that happened uh we have a new band list that's in effect you know a lot of things have happened since then but and i wanted to bring on a guest who knows a little bit about the game and able to shine some light in a competitive aspect for you guys especially for whether you're a casual player collector or even like one of the most competitive players uh so without any further ado i would like to introduce our guest tonight he is the five-time ycs winner chris leblanc how's it going thanks for making some time out of your busy schedule to come in here and chit chat with us and talk Yu-Gi-Oh. oh yeah i'm happy to be on you know i love Yu-Gi-Oh, so i'm always willing to talk about it whenever to anybody you know Oh, absolutely. For sure. Uh, is there any plugins or shout outs, anything you'd like to say or give notice to before we get into things? Uh, first thing I want to shout out uh, my team, uh, Team Planeta. Um, I recently joined them um, and they've uh, been making this year uh, like go pretty smoothly so far. Um, so shout out to them. And then I'll shout out my Twitter is at Chris underscore LeBlanc 97. And then uh, my YouTube is at Chris LeBlanc 6227. Um, but I'm pretty sure you can just look up like Crystal Blanc and then like Yu-Gi-Oh on YouTube and like my account will pop up. So yeah, just look Those up YCS out. topping Crystal Blanc, right? Yeah, I post most of my profiles <laughs> on my account, so it's it's easy to find. Like if you want to look for like my my profiles and stuff. Yeah, for those who don't know, uh, Crystal Blanc is tied now currently with the most YCS wins for any North American player, being five. He's got the the five rings. He's got that five Pete right there. Oh, <laughs> showing. So you do. How does it feel to be one of the best players in North America? I mean, right now, because I mean, no, I'd say Jesse recently uh, definitely passed me. I mean, he has six. Uh, at the end of the day, like that's that's what we go off of. Um, Polly also with his like debut at Worlds, like winning Worlds is like up there. Like it's obviously a dream of mine as well. Yeah, shout out to Polly. Catching up to Polly in a way of like winning Worlds for myself, and then like catching up to Jesse and like the ring department, you know, like would be nice. So like it's good motivation though. It's always good to have people that like, even if like 
like being the best doesn't really sound all that great because like, you don't really have that motivation to want to be better. But at the end of the day, like I like that rivalry. I like the like it's like it's a like a friendship rivalry, which is nice too as well. So you like you just keep going to these events, competing, and you just want to do better because you see other people do well. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you say uh, Jesse has six. And for those who are listening who don't know, Jesse technically has six wins. Uh, only yeah, five so. of them are YCSs. Uh, one of them was the UDS, which actually discontinued. So he technically has six championships, but yeah. only five of them are YCS. So yeah, but he, he is one of like the arguably one of the best ones. Yeah. So but like, so who do you think? Because I put my money on you being the underdog getting the, the, the sixth one first. Do you really think that you can beat him out? getting the title number six um i think for ycs's uh yeah that's definitely my goal is to be the first person with six ycs's but at the end of the day like it's not going to stop there i feel like i'm not going to be content like i'm i could win another event and then still want to win like another one after that because i want to be the first of the seven at this point you know it's 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 just going to keep going up and like i feel sometimes this man's trying to be better than jordan sometimes it feels like me and jesse are uh, like a league of our own but there's a lot of our friends that have won like multiple ycs's in the past few years that have also like been there with us so it's not it's not really like just because like we have like the amount of wins that we have it doesn't really put us like in that category alone because there are a lot of top contenders like in our friend group even like outside of our friend group that are like uh, like a big threat in the game so it's it's nice you know is it something that you kind of like knew what happened when you first started playing Yu-Gi-Oh! Like you started you started playing as like, a, you know, I'm saying little, and then like you'd be like, oh, well, one day I'm going to win a YCS or one day I'm going to Worlds or, you know, or I, did you just like enjoy the card Worlds, game itself and just kind of want to play and see how it went? Worlds was different. I feel like that came after doing well at YCSs, but like, um, uh, I mean, like, I can't really say that I expected to win my first YCS because it was when I was 15 and it was my first YCS top. So I feel like that was kind of surreal in itself um a lot that came with it was like being the guy that like like being the kid actually not even the guy at this point so like the kid yeah, right, that, like won sure. an event like his first top you know he got lucky whatever you know it just comes with it you kind of have to prove yourself after that so i guess that was my motivation after my first win to like want to like win again or, or even top again just to like prove that like you know, i belong there no i could agree with that 100 percent. It, it does start small but like I know when I first got into playing Yu-Gi-Oh, it was like casually with my friends and I just wanted to be the best out of my friends. Yeah. And it was like, you know, four of us sitting there playing a bunch of rogue fucking decks until one of us would win. But uh, then I started, you know, being like, all right, well, if I can be the best in my friend group, then maybe I could be the best in my locals. Then I'll go to locals and then top of locals and be like, all right, well, maybe if I'm the best in my locals, I could be the best in my region. And then we went to regionals and stuff like that. So, you know, it always starts out small, but it definitely does kind of snowball the more love you kind of obtain for the game uh, into bigger things and bigger accolades and bigger wants and desires. Yeah, I totally agree. And it, it kind of felt like for me, I was jumping in very quick because um, I was playtesting uh, with my neighbor. And this was when I was probably like seven, seven years old, like where I was playtesting with him. And then he had this friend and then all of a sudden his friend won in SJC. So like that kind of put like the bar like really high, like really early in life. But I didn't even know yeah. like that meant <laughs> really like, realistically back then um, when I was like that age. Um, but it was kind of cool, like just to be around it. And then that definitely pushed a lot of people around me. So it's just kind of snowballs like off of each other, which is really nice. Um, and then like, honestly, later on in my, um, in my life, like probably like 2009, 2010, 2011, I was around a lot of top uh, players as well. Like, uh, Joe Girolando, um, Joe Bogley. I had like Stefan. Like yeah. Stefan's notable for sure. Yeah, 100%. Like, definitely growing up, like, that was the, the group that were, like, I was looking up to and definitely learning a lot from, so. It's playing with higher brains like that who kind of understand the game a little bit more or at least have a different approach to the game that actually elevates everyone else around you. Like, you may see something that he, another person doesn't, and then you're, you guys are able to collaborate on that and solve a problem that um, other people may not even see forming to begin with. You know what I'm saying? So, like, that's how you, I think, get better as a player by not only upgrading yourself as a player, but upgrading the people that you're also playtesting around. My dad taught me something as a kid and it was the rule of five. So whatever the first four people in your friend group are, you're gonna be the fifth. If all four people around you are drug dealers, you're gonna be the fifth. If all four people around you are bums, you're gonna be the fifth. But if all four people around you are successful, you're gonna be the fifth one. If all four people around you are ambitious and have drive, you're gonna have ambition and drive. So it's always about the people you keep around you for sure, I think. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's why I've made a, 
like huge decisions early on in my life when I was like um, around the age of like 17 through like 20, I've made decisions to live with like certain friend groups or like different states. Um, it definitely benefited me. Like I've definitely one become more cultured, but also like become more like uh, like uh, I want to say like in tune with the different areas like in inside the United States. Like yeah, and I pretty much feel like I I can go anywhere and understand like like the people, like the community. Yeah, I can understand that every region is different, and the more you're in there, the more I like to learn things like that. But speaking about the uh, YCS as in competitive play, uh, for those who don't know, YCS Cancun was over the weekend. Basically, I want to say Key Curioso, who uh, won it all with Flunderies, if I'm saying that name right. And it was a great event. Uh, for those who are, need a reminder, we had the top cut being a majority of uh, Unchained and Kashira, along with a couple flu players, a pair of Medadium players and Pure players, two Branded players, two Rescue Ace players, and a whole bunch of others. So it was very, very, vi very diverse. Uh, but for something like Cancun, because if I'm hearing correctly, you didn't partake in Cancun, but you did attend the event, but you didn't like actually partake in it. Is that correct? I did attend the event and I did not partake. Um, I think leading up to it, I was just like dealing with a lot. Like uh, overall, like I was sick, like uh, for like a week in between like the two events before. I had also just traveled to three different countries, like pretty far spread out. Like it's. It definitely threw me off um and then like getting to cancun being overwhelmed with like oh it's cancun like you know i wanted to see your friends go out and then do all this stuff and then realizing that there's just the whole ycs it kind of didn't really feel real that there was a ycs that weekend so you know <laughs> i just you know i decided to take it off and i don't regret it at all i mean i went to the event still because i wanted to you know do a little bit of coverage like take some pictures um and I think it was definitely definitely worth going for sure, seeing everybody. There's more American Yu-Gi-Oh players there, I think, than I've ever seen at like a foreign YCS. So it was definitely a, like a surprise to me. And it was nice. So what was the uh the story with uh your deck list? I heard that you had like a wrong deck list. Did you enter it wrong or was it like No, not Cancun. I didn't even I didn't even um like enter my deck list because they allow you to enter on day two. So I just like didn't even like enter my deck i didn't go on day two so there's no point oh uh, okay so you don't even have to put your deck list in until you even hit day two yeah so like in north america they'll make you do it at like 10 a.m and then like you'll get yeah, the exactly. coin automatically but like we didn't get the coin like that's what you like sacrifice by doing it on day two so like it's it's, it's oh, definitely worth okay. it and i think uh not a lot of people know about it obviously because i mean it, it, it used to be like that but now it's they're very strict on um like getting your deck list in at, at 10 a.m which is fine because yeah. like you want you want like organization like that but at the end of the day it's like i'd 100 sacrifice a gold coin or uh, he like any type of coin to to make sure i could just have more time working on my deck yeah speaking of which so tell us a little bit about your preparations i mean i, I, I obviously you didn't go to cancun knowing you wouldn't play you, you came to cancun with a, yeah. an actual game plan of uh how to attack it so like what were your preparations uh for what the ycs cancun Oh, I think the preparations are just all in the events I played before. Um, I definitely learned a lot about the Unchained uh, deck after Vancouver, during Vancouver. Because, um, like, no matter how much, like, I played the matchup, like, I feel like there was, like, still a lot of minuscule interactions that were important. So, mm -hmm. um, testing, like, with Hani. Hani's been getting me hip to a lot of stuff. Like, he does, I feel like, the most testing, like, out of our group. Um, also, like, he does a ton of coaching as well. So, like, he, he definitely uh, takes on a lot. Um, but at the end of the day, it makes it easier for like, uh, like the people that do like less, less of the testing, but also can come to the same conclusion and play a deck like just as well. So it's, it's definitely takes a, like that solid friend group, uh, play testing group, honestly, that's been getting me through it. So you definitely would say it's like more of a team effort. You're not really yeah. like doing things on your own so much. Definitely a team effort. Um, definitely definitely are rewarded for like reaching out and like discussing ideas you know sometimes one person will have like an idea that will like be that the, the impact of that weekend or like you know some sometimes it's, it, it changes too it's not always the same person like it, or two people could come to the same conclusion like it's that, yeah yeah it's, so you it's, typically it's, like go back to prepare i would say with like um like the same people like do you typically have like a, a a group of the same people that you go back to to like bounce ideas off of or is it different for every event for different area for different times um sometimes when i'm back in mass like there's like uh like people like it, we're, we're all in the same like circle of like like we have like a discord where it's like i believe it's like 10 of us 
where like that's like our group like like our play testing group like outside of that we don't really share the, the like our like our deck ideas but i mean at the end of the day it's like that's how like everyone really is but i'd say ours is kind of big compared to how it used to be when i was younger like when i was younger it was like four or five and maybe we think about like a six but like it's it's definitely uh more beneficial now to because like not everyone goes to every event there's like a small group of us like me pat and honey um i'd say kamal uh like goes like to the majority of them but like me pat and honey go to all of them so it's like that'll normally be like testing group we might not even play the same deck but just like hearing ideas for sure like always so for i would say from let's say from the outside looking in uh, how would you guys go about at like let's say adding someone to that play testing circle because obviously you guys are of a certain caliber so is it like hey guys i got this one guy i've been playing with uh i think that he could benefit from your practice or do you guys kind of unanimously be like all right well let's just say joshua schmidt is in this this format or he's solved the format let's include him in like or is it kind of like no matter who's doing what you guys always remain this is the group yeah the group pretty much stays the same it doesn't really change unless like like a random occurrence where pat or somebody will be like yo like we should add this person to the group but it doesn't because like for, for one like you know it's not all about just like whether like or not you know the format or if you have the, you could have the best deck but at the end of the day it's like if you're going to be cool within our friend group as well like it's not like just all about the Yu-Gi-Oh side of it because like and we just care about the results but it's it's more so like being able to like work with somebody like somebody that we know we can trust like that's a big part of it like trust is like the main thing like absolutely that's why like i'm not just gonna add anybody even if they're like you know insane but um a lot of the people like we know like like through the time of us playing Yu-Gi-Oh, like it's kind of gotten to the point where we, we do have these people that we can trust and we know we've known for a while so it's it's not that hard now to pick people but before it might have been i can understand plus like there's always people who are more in it for their own self-interest or their own self-growth yeah. rather than the growth of the group. So, like, I can understand being very particular or picky about who you let into a, a group, especially with names like, you know, like who you just mentioned, Hani, Pat Holbin, shit like that. Like, those are a lot of reputationable names, and you don't want them, uh, I would say, the idea is going into bad hands with security of, the, I guess, the group, you know, be, being in question, so... I can understand yeah. that. I'm just curious, because, like, from the outside looking in, I know, like, when I was a, a new player... And I know, like I said, the rule of five, to get better, you got to be around four other good players. Uh, it's hard for people who aren't of that caliber yet to find people to take them seriously or even consider them to have valid opinions. Because I know I may not be the most competitive player. I do have a competitive mindset, but I'm not, I don't have any like notable wins i've placed in a couple of regionals i've won it uh i placed in an ots championship a couple of times but i don't have any like real wins under my belt or like real notable accolades but i still like to think of myself as a competitive player so even for someone or another player like like myself uh i know it's hard to get into better groups because you have to prove yourself one and you only prove yourself by going to major events and actually doing well making a name for yourself uh, and then it's also hard because some people are just not open to play testing with other people, regardless on if they're good or not. Like some people are very, very closed off. Uh, so I was just you know curious to see like what you're at to say. I, I ask a lot of competitive players just because I think it's always good to have that competitive mindset. But for other people who are listening who aren't there yet, they need somewhere to kind of like guide up to or like some sort of like structure to follow so that way they can get into those rankings and get into the and i'm not saying they can't make their own play test group and then become something but it's definitely a little easier when you have help from people who are willing to lend the hand down to pull somebody up than someone who has to do all the work themselves you know yeah and and it's totally like um it's i want you to like imagine it as if you're like looking at like uh like like sports like scouts like for like a, like basketball or something and like that's like kind of like the competitive players and then like all the players that like aren't really known yet or like haven't made a name for themselves like are playing these events throughout a the year they may go to all the events and do something that impresses like a like a certain group and then they, they might be added to that group that's kind of like how i like to see it it's it's kind of like everyone's being scouted like all the times like do something to impress like not just like us but like somebody else and like you know that could just be like a friendship like made right right there you know yeah, word of mouth is very, very strong. Yes, yes. So when you guys are usually together and let's just say uh, a YCS is coming up or, a, a, you know what I'm saying, like a big event, maybe uh, 
a 3v3 or some crazy shit. So how do you guys typically plan to like make meta calls for formats? Like what do you guys take into consideration? How do you guys plan? What's your approach? Do you guys uh, tweak your practice schedules at all? Uh, does it increase, decrease, you know, like what do you guys typically do to prepare for an event regardless? Um, well, for one, it definitely matters where you're playing the event, um, whether it's in South America, Central Europe or North America. Um, it's it, it definitely like the range varies on like what the meta could be. That's something you need to look into. And like, it's definitely nice having people that travel to those countries, like when you're like discussing events, like because like they kind of have an idea of like how players have ten uh, tended to be like in the past. Um, Definitely, like, spending, like, as much time, like, playtesting IRL together is a huge thing. Like, if you're not doing that, like, I think you're not going to be in tune, especially for a 3v3. Just even if it's not a 3v3, just, like, preparing for an event, like, period. Like, definitely just need to be spent. Like, it, it's tough for people because, obviously, like, most people's testing is, like, done online. They don't see, like, the people they want to playtest with as much. They live in different spots. But, I mean, that's, like, why it's always, like, a challenge to, like, you know, Play test IRL, but definitely one of those things that's like definitely proven like worth overtime. No, I agree. I, I think personally, a lot of finding the meta call for formats is to find out, like, let's just say I'm interested in this one deck. So, what does your deck end on? What can your deck play through? And then, how does my end board compete or give me an advantage against other end boards in the format? So, if I can, let's say, a good meta call for YCS Cancun would be Flunderies because it is a direct counter to the hype deck in that room, which would be Unchained. Unchained needs special summon monsters. They have a lot of link monsters, so they fall to Mpen, preventing them from activating. And then they also yep. fall to their their own mechanic, having to destroy or link off with special summon monsters. And so that would be a call where it's like, all right, the meta is going to be doing this. They're going to be uh, linking a lot. They're going to be disrupting special summon monsters they're going to be yada yada popping whatever uh a good call for that would be something like for which normal summons a lot they have empen that stops link monsters and stuff like that so um is there anything that you guys kind of like try to typically do do you play a bunch of different decks to see what's better do you fall typically on like one deck that you you are uh, familiar with and then see how that goes and then let's say something beats you that's better that takes your interest you kind of fall that way or you know is there like a difference between the two there's been a lot of events where we've definitely gone into it like we don't really care people can see our deck it doesn't matter i feel like here like was the format that it was like the most like that um i would definitely yeah, going into an event where you like definitely practice you have to like be able to like identify like what the decks people are going to bring or what what people are trying to counter and that's very easy easily done by looking at like the last top cut of like the last event because people see these decks, they're like, oh, I'm gonna play this. But like, you know, like you kind of see where the meta shifts. Like, obviously it's a lot harder when you're going from event to event to event, but like you can tell like there's a huge difference in like how people play their non-engine. People play like the like the different amounts of engine, like like just after yeah, one event. breakers so, over hand traps, yada, yada. Yeah, so like kind of like identifying that, um, it's like how we want to build our deck. Like we want to identify that and then be able to just do it like it, it, into the next, like being always being one step ahead, which is like a huge thing. Like if you're if you're not going to be one step ahead, then you're just like playing with everyone else. And like obviously, like in a format like tier, it was, that was fine. But like in, in formats where like you need like a deck advantage, like definitely want to have one. No, like Jesse, I, I like for that. example, with his Mar when he played Marionette, like obviously he had like an advantage. Like there's like there's always going to be something that gives you a deck advantage, which like even it could be something small, but it, it definitely definitely matters so how do you guys go about finding um like your tech cards of choice for decks so like speaking of like like that of jesse cotton so his tech card was marrying that might in the in the side deck for the mirror match now i know some other players may not have committed to playing it but other players knew about Mary Night Might and stuff like that. So, like, how do you yeah. guys find your tech cards for choice? Do you guys wait for, like, a referral? Do you guys scan through all the cards? Like, I know myself personally, when I knew Cash Cheer was on the chopping block the first time, or when they had limited a Rise Heart, um, I was ready for them to hit cards like Birth. I was ready for them to hit cards like uh, Unicorn. So, I was already pouring through. Uh, I would pull up EDO or I would pull up uh, Nexus or neuron or whatever it was and i would literally type in special summon level seven and then pour through all the cards that that did that and eventually i'd find cards like if unicorn got hit i would replace it with um 
Planet Pathfinder, which is another way to see your field spell to get to the one unicorn that would have been there. Or if Birth was hit, there was a card called Overlay Network, which is basically a special summon. Target a monster you control, special one from the grave or your hand of the same level. And then once per turn, you could target an XYZ monster you control, which was probably supposed to be Rise Heart. And you can attach one of its materials to your hand. You can add it to your hand. So it was a good way to kind of like a replacement for Birth. But those are tech cards that I was kind of looking for in, in place of certain cards that were probably going to get hit. So when you guys find yourself using tech cards, is it more like a, a word of mouth? This person's playing this. I kind of consider this. Do people bring things to you? Do you watch deck profiles? Or do you kind of just go through and play these cards yourself? There's definitely um, people in the group that have their strengths, like um, like for deck building. And I think a lot of the time it comes from them or like it, it could honestly come from like anybody, like where you just like happen to hear from like somebody about a card um, or like you just like think of it like like an interaction. Like that happens a lot of the time where like one of us just thinks of it, like like on the spot, like, oh, like this is good. This is a good out to this because like of our knowledge from playing the game over time. Um, uh looking looking up cards like keywords uh definitely helps like if you're trying to like like you said deal with the cards that like searches your field spell like planet pathfinder is a card we came across like in 2016 like, so something like that would be in our mind when we like we think about it like like having to do with like field spells you know so it's it definitely um it's definitely super relevant though to um like look look that up like in with the keywords the keywords are definitely re very helpful um but if you want to sit there and go through every card of the game like we've done it multiple times like we used to do it in between every event like trying to think of stuff like it could literally have been the same deck we played like the week before but we'd still do it just like as like a ritual you know do you like searching for your own tech cards or do you like being referred to certain tech cards um i like bouncing ideas back back and forth off uh from my friends like i think that like even if I come up with like a tech card, if like it's not like agreed upon in the group, like oh, we're gonna go back and forth and it's not gonna just be like, oh, that's bad. Like it's, we're gonna talk about it, why it's bad, like the reason why you shouldn't play it or if it's good, the reason why you should play it. And then like, like there's always gonna be cons to playing a card. So like, you just kind of have to look at it like that. Like, you know, you're gonna, not arguing, but like going back and forth for sure about cards all the time. No, I agree. Every, every format like kind of like surprises me with like what cards like, are good out of nowhere, like all of a sudden as well. Like, like look at Book of Moot. Like, like that card. I'm sure you could have asked me like six years ago that card that ever see play like today. Like, and I was like, no. Like, yeah. anything could be a three of staple in every single deck yeah. in the format. You'll never see that. <laughs> exactly, it's a huge, a huge part of the game now. It's like like the old cards coming back, which is nice. Speaking of cards, what are your thoughts on the now ineffective ban list for September 2023? For those who don't remember or were under a rock for the last couple of weeks, Arise Heart got banned, Bissiel Magnema and Chaos Space went to one. There were no semi-limited hits. And then Herald of the Orange Light and Salmon Great Gazelle went to three. So it was a pretty small list, but what were your thoughts over it? Was it underwhelming, overwhelming? Was it just right? Leap too um, much out? I, I liked it. I like the list. Um, there were some cards that could have been added. Um, probably like, like Erad's one of those cards that only should be added because of the Labyrinth deck. But at the end of the day, I think it's like a fair card if you take that like deck out of question. Um, and then I would say like Arise Heart obviously had to get banned. Magnemut hit to one was good. I think they could have probably hit like Lubellion like two. Like I think that engine is still really good. Um, Chaos Space obviously got hit the one that needed to happen, that or banned. Um, but I mean, one's fine. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, other than that, I, I like I like the list. It was been a while. Uh, everyone's wait, wait, been waiting for Raz Hard to get hit. Obviously, that was like the main one. Like, the, like that opens up the format to like a lot of different graveyard decks, a lot more combo decks. Um, obviously, you still have to worry about Shifter, but in like like half the decks now, so that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's big facts. I was definitely a, a real big uh, a Rise Heart advocate. I played Cash Terra since Darkwing Blast, since before it was even really good. I, I was out there playing fucking oh, Instant remember. Contact yeah, and that. yeah, Spirit and Neos and all the bad fucking sevens. So everyone who has an opinion about a Rise Heart now can shut the fuck up because back <laughs> in December of last year, you guys weren't complaining about Cash Terra then. You know, not right. to say that Cash or Rise Heart isn't a powerful card. I do understand and acknowledge that he does do a lot, but a lot of cards do a lot in this format uh, me and a bunch of local guys were actually having a discussion that if a card doesn't do at least three things one of which being a graveyard effect it's probably not relevant in the format for the most part majority of the time so to say that a rice heart was anything short of powerful i'll give you that but 
did I think it deserved to be banned? Uh, probably not. I think that there were other things that could have been banned. I think that a rice heart by itself at one was the right amount. Like you can't overcommit to it or commit too early to it because then it gets outed. You can't commit too late because then it doesn't matter. You know what I'm saying? Like you have to find a, a, a happy medium between it. So I didn't think it personally needed to go, but I do understand that powerful cards need to be kept at bay so that way other decks can come into the format as well as allow people to have some deck choices. Cause like I'm personally, I know all the competitive players probably disagree because I'd be seeing all their opinions on X and shit like that. Uh, but I'm one of those people where I actually thoroughly enjoy a format where there's a bunch of different decks in the room. Like I don't, I mean, I may, you know, practice or play test to beat a specific handful of them but i i think it's healthy when there's a bunch of decks in the format that can still compete at the level of the meta decks like i don't have a problem with that yes it's hard to account for and counter all of these decks but that's i think that's where the skill comes in what are you more often going to see what are you more like what is your deck inherently good against what do you need your side deck for to help you in certain matchups like i just think that's a part of the game so the ban list was a little bit, I think, too heavy on the cash because, I mean, they could have done other things like limit Fenrir so it's not more splashable. Uh, limit the Unicorn or the happen. Birth. Yeah, 100%. I thought it was too. I was already in the midst of looking for all these cards, but there's no replacements for cards like Rise Heart. This deck just has to take a seat now. You know what I'm saying? So I, that's why I was kind of like, eh, I'm not really too too keen on this ban list. Yeah, I, I think that these smaller ban lists kind of prepares for bigger hits in the next like usually when they do a small ban list the next ban list is pretty big pretty hefty they'll, they'll usually just do the slaughtering so probably in our january february like ban list we'll probably see something similar to that but personally i just don't know if it was right to outright ban a rise art my own opinion yeah uh, i mean i i think it definitely should have got banned i mean the card just limited deck building and i don't think konami likes that um so like I I would say it's a it's a good hit. I mean definitely like took away all the graveyard decks. I mean tier was already hit, so it's not like it like made the difference there. But even with the rise heart being as powerful as it was, it was still falling out of favor. Either whether people were bored of playing it or maybe they just didn't think it was strong enough. Like it was at one point even when a rise heart just got hit to one, I think there was way more representation for it then than when they hit the card itself. Like when they hit the card, it was probably like the third best deck in the room behind like Pirelli, um, Unchained and other decks like that. I think it just became like the brick deck. Everyone kind of looked at it like that. So that's why like the Oh yeah, it loses it. to itself like crazy. I would know. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's really what it was. I mean like I played it for one event for Philly and like I got 70th, but like I like went X3 and then like I had a really good day one and I just bricked day two. So it's like not much you can do about it, you know? Yeah, but is that ban worthy? I wouldn't say, I would say with the way they, they've hit things in the past, for sure. That's different. That's a, that's a different take. I, I would not, say. not from, not from like a perspective of like, oh, it's like OP like that, but it definitely did with Nats. So you have to keep that in mind. Like it was already probably on the top of their list like you know like in the, the day like the list is made before like you see all these like like different like events like in the changes like like certain cards are already getting hit no matter what like there's nothing you can do to like reverse that so i think that was just the one that they needed to, to do without hurting the engine like and i think they wanted the cards to be more splashable like fenrir still so i think that's a big part of it but is that good is is having cards like fenrir splashable in other decks besides cash is that necessarily a good thing i mean i don't I don't personally view that as like the best thing. I think it makes the format more diverse for sure. I mean, but how, how do you argue that it's diverse when, and let's just say, uh, Cash Share is obviously playing it, and then you got Pirelli playing it because they need a discard outlet and then pressure on the field, and then you got Sprite players playing it because it's an extra body to link off with and it allows pressure on the field. And now it's being splashed into all these decks. Like, I don't think that. For that, just limit the card. That's the same problem we had with Sky Strike. I, I, I agree. I think it definitely should be limited because of how powerful it is. Um, but definitely, like being able to throw it in like certain decks, like kind of gives that deck like like life. Like realistically, like it's not gonna. Sometimes the deck isn't gonna be good enough unless it has that like sort of like that non-engine engine card that just like fits in like the deck. You know, like I kind of I kind of see it like that. Like it's some decks aren't even, wouldn't even be a thing if they didn't have Fender. I guess. The only deck I would find it okay in to splash it would be decks like um, uh, Naturia, where they needed an extra Earth Body to synchro with. Uh, it was uh, allowed them to go into higher level synchros like Barone, um, Psychic and Punisher. Uh, 
what's the other one? Despota and shit like that. Like they were able to go into better synchros because they had a higher level body. But I think the ability, I think that if every single deck in that room, if I look at the top cut and there's seven different decks and six out of those seven decks are all playing cash share of Fenrir, that there's no diversity in it. I think that you're just all trying to make a deck that just makes Fenrir the most broken possible. I think that's when it would get hit if, once I see that. I don't think it's in every deck right now, but it's definitely in like a good amount, like to where it's like on the edge of like whether or not it's gonna get hit. That I'd agree with more. I'd rather them hit, hit cards like Fenrir than Arise Heart. Like, why would you hit the card for a specific deck than something splashable? The deck itself, I wouldn't say is that crazy. I, I'd say that card specifically in Fenrir as well. Fenrir is one of those cards that's like that insane that like, like yeah, like it is definitely ban worthy, hittable like to, to one like. For sure. That I'll give you. I, I can definitely agree with Fenrir probably should have gotten somewhat touched on this list before Arise. At least before Arise, in my eyes. You know what I'm saying? But that's just me. I'm a I'm a cry hard cash tier player who just wants to yeah. and complain about my favorite card's gone. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now it's back to the drawing board for me. But speaking of decks, I mean like what is what do you think now is like the quote unquote best deck of like the future format? Like it's it's just an, another format where it's like undefined we're in between brand new sets we got uh age of overlord coming soon duelist nexus just dropped we had a whole we're in the synchro format like what do you think might be the future best deck as far as deck ceiling representation as far as well as conversion rate and like skill requirement and things like that i'd say there's multiple um like unchained pearly are definitely like my top two picks um rescue ace is definitely about to, like about to get better like uh manadium is definitely about to get better those like manadium is probably like my third choice for the format like is like the most powerful but obviously like it bricks like that's why it's like i would say like questionable um fair. yeah it's fair but, but those, those those decks really um at the end of the day like chimera is going to be in the format but it's, it's really just like not like a event winning deck i would say it could win an event but it's not something i would just like put my money on um but unchain pearly and yeah manadium for sure hmm, that's interesting I, I mean i definitely agree with pirelli being good, I definitely agree with Unchained being at least the most represented. I wouldn't say the highest ceiling this time, where so, you know you can beat that deck um, if you if you play it swiftly enough. But I think th I think we're actually going to start seeing decks more like uh, as you said, like Manadium, a little bit more outside coming in. Uh, decks like Rescue Ace when they get more support in the upcoming uh, main core set. Even decks like Full Under Ease, a tier two choice uh, a couple formats ago to being probably one of the most easily picked up, budget friendly. Uh, high ceiling decks that there is in the format right now so yeah i definitely think flunder is uh you're gonna see a lot of representation but still at the end of the day like like how like going into an event bringing it yourself like knowing that it, it, you could just break in top cut and then like be out of the tournament it's very like disheartening because like you don't want to do that but like also you have to give yourself the best chance to win so yeah. there's some sometimes you make the like the decision to play a deck that like has a higher like you know higher ceiling but definitely like a lower like chance of you drawing like playable but it's part of the game not sure no, i agree i agree those are all some good picks too speaking of which i got a, I had a question personally but do you as a competitive player go to your locals and if you do or even if you don't how important is your locals or would you say locals is to someone who wants to be a competitive player um i definitely think you should be going to locals if you want to be a competitive player um for me i think at this point i definitely learn like Stuff that I would not like be learning normally because you play versus like the variety of decks, um, which is better. Like when you like, if you're especially if your friend group is playing all the same deck, like you definitely need that like those interactions. Like you need to learn that. Um, also, like the community is like nice to be around as well. Like kind of gets you like in the mood, like motivated to like play an event. You know, being around Yu-Gi-Oh players definitely helps you like get in the mindset, like going into a regional, like anything. No, I agree because uh, a lot of people like I know. Uh champions like Paul Aronson, he rarely goes to locals if ever. He likes to do his practice on du dueling book and DB and online simulators because he feels as though it's about the quality of the practice, not the quantity of the practice. If you're going to a locals, you can play a five round um, locals and be the best one there. But if you didn't learn anything or if you're not playing anything new, his argument was like, you're, what's the point of going to a locals and being the best one at your locals when you can go play online and go play someone who's better than you, who you'll learn more from. And 
I can agree with that viewpoint of like it's about like the quality of player that you're playing against and locals probably isn't the best yielding as, as far as competitive players but i do feel like going to locals is very very important for any player whether you're competitive casual a collector anyway like whether you it's the place where you can interact the most with more people in your scene uh as you said you get a variety of different decks you're not just playing against quote unquote the top decks in the room you're playing against things like runic you're playing against things like volcanics you know you're playing against things like branded other other decks are definitely going to be present and it gives you a little bit more of a well round as far as like a pilot being able to navigate through these waters that you're unfamiliar with and as well as like little things like access to certain cards um the ability to borrow uh or you know have certain cards at your fingertips or be able to purchase things for yourself but i i personally think that no matter how high you get in this game you should always go to a local store support your local ots as well as support the local people because like you may not get anything personally from your locals but i guarantee your locals will get something personally from you you know what i'm saying it kind of like uh, the ability to help others get to your level as well as you know keep make sure that you're still as sharp as you can be so i'm just curious yeah. to see like everyone takes on it you know yeah no that's definitely something that like i do like i have recognized like you know i i do kind of like the aspect of the game like being able to help people and then like going to locals like you you're right like you you will not always learn something from going to locals but like the feeling of helping somebody else learn something like you know maybe like you trade off like one like five things you teach them and like they just teach you like one thing like not obviously not like a like a legitimate trade but you know like just over time yeah. like you know it's, it's still like just that that benefit is definitely but it's definitely good to nice you because trade. let's say as as a as a newer player your cup is kind of empty whereas as a as a well-seasoned well-rounded player like yourself your cup is kind of full so i would expect inexperienced players to gain more from you than you to gain from them but that doesn't mean that every person's opinion is invalid just because they're not topping YCSs or you know in the best of playtesting pools or they don't have a team behind them or they're not sponsored like everyone's opinion still may be valid Some, someone at locals could tell you about a card that you may not have known about and like you said like that that's that one that they give you that you might be like, damn, you know, I didn't think about that, or I didn't think about using that card in that in that way. I, I know that there's a lot of different applications to the same card that everyone uses, and everyone uses it different in every deck. So it's just having the ability to, or the access, I should say, to knowing like the little things that might slip through the cracks, I think is very, very pivotal as growing it. You know, I don't care how big of a competitive person you might be, there's always something you can learn from someone, even if it's yep. not much. So you, so you do agree that locals is pretty important. Though. Oh yeah. So speaking of helping people, cause I know that's something that I personally like doing, even if it is like going to a locals and even while we're playing at a local round, I might help my opponent uh, play a little bit better, maybe get some technical skills. Hey, don't ash that. You might want to ash this. You might want to keep this hand trap for a little later, see what, you know, the person's on. If I'm correct, you're uh, a coach, right? Or yeah. How important would you say coaching is to you? And I'm not, Thing you as like your ability to coach i'm just saying how important is the the concept of coaching or getting a coach to a player who is inexperienced or may not know anything do you think that it would benefit someone is there things that you can get through a coach that you can't get from like watching replays or youtube twitch i know some people can turn on a a pack stream or a ggygo stream or even a db grinder video and still learn something about the format without getting a coach but like what would you say is uh important about coaching to you and what benefits would it bring um i definitely think that like it's helped me a lot like through my process and a lot of my friends and like the ability to do it is nice um obviously like with like it comes with like like a mental toll because like obviously i don't like charging people money but at the end of the day i try to give out as many free coaching sessions as i can um like but I think that aspect of it, like being able to like help people is like my favorite part of it. Um, but also on top of that, um, you can definitely learn like a bunch of stuff from all of those channels. Um, but at the end of the day, like, I think what it really comes down to is like the coaching you're going to get from like me, Hani or Kamal or like any of our other friends. Like it's going to be about not so much like, like learning, like you could, you could learn everything you want to know about the game, like online. But at the end of the day, like learning how to play test, how to, to like, to go to an event and how to prep like what things to like look out for that next level like 
like strategy and like and i think even for like beginners obviously it's helpful but i think um they don't get as much as the people that are trying to be like competitive with it and i think that's what i try to target my audience is like the people that want to be competitive um but they definitely have learned like more like outside of like the barrier that like what like the online content is and i feel like it's kind of limiting um because obviously like anyone can learn how to play a deck anyone can learn how to like do, do the interactions like honestly that's why i don't go over that as much like uh, if there's something like i find out like i'll tell you about it like right away because like i find out information quick but at the end of the day it's like you can learn this online or just by playing games and that's kind of like how i teach my my students like a lot of it is like event prep um how to build your deck for an event how to go over like side patterns like that's a big big thing like people have a hard time memorizing like what, what cards aside and they'll side like randomly yep. um but that's like something you go over um how to be efficient when play testing is a huge thing. Um yeah, on it, honestly like there's there's a lot there's a lot more to it as well. Like having like, a lot of a lot of my students have come to me with like confidence issues as well. And that's something like you have to teach people like not everyone's just going to like know how to like be around people. They're not going to know how to be in these these settings and that's like a lot that comes with it. It's not just like about the Yu-Gi-Oh side of it, you know. It's it's about being a person as well, being in the community, being able to like guide these people and to like you know i've had a lot of experience so i'm lucky enough to be able to help i agree with that and i also would say that another big benefit of getting a coach too because i'm under i'm a big person where i believe that you should get a coach in anything you do i think that doing it yourself is ignorant and let's just say if i wanted to go be a bodybuilder i'm not going to just go to the gym blindly and think that well if i just lift weights all day i'm eventually going to be a bodybuilder my muscles will get big no you get a gym coach if you want to eat healthy, you don't just be, well, I'm just going to go to the store and go buy all Whole Foods items. And, you know, you know, you get a nutritionist or sorry, you, you get a nutritionist like you get, you know, if you wanted to be a, a chef, you're not going to just say, well, if I cook enough in my kitchen, I'm going to be a good chef. No, you, you got to go to a restaurant and be under an internship with an actual superior chef. You know what I'm saying? You got to There's always someone who has to teach you something that you don't know. Otherwise, you would have known it. You know what I'm saying? So that's why I personally feel with coaching that it's good for Yu-Gi-Oh. It also brings a big benefit as far as it's one-on-one. -on -one. You, If I were to p turn on a YouTube video and I'm watching a DB Grinder video, yeah, he may explain some interactions, but he's not maybe not explaining it the way I might interpret it. Let's just say I'm brand new and I don't know what a brick is. I don't know what a garnet is. I don't know what these terms are. Like the one-on-one -on -one is to sit down and catch you up. All right, where are you faulting at? Where can I pick you up? Where are you... Uh, where your weaknesses, what your strengths, what can we play into? So like that one on one. I know I'm a very hands on person when I go to learn something. You can put, you can write it as clear as day and put as many pictures on it as you as you want. But I won't learn it until I'm personally doing it. So that's just the way I learn, and I, I know a lot of people are, are kind of like that. But coaching also allows you to give that certain attention to that one person. Like when you're when you're in a class of like. 30 people it's hard to kind of single out someone's uh needs or wants because it doesn't go with the group you know what i'm saying you got to uh, you know count with the group or something like that um but when you have a coach or a coach someone who's sitting there one-on-one -on -one, they're they're literally there to cater to you which i think is better than just watching videos or watching other people commentate on things when they may not be necessarily putting it in a light that you can understand or presenting it in a way that's digestible for you where a coach might be able to break things down because they understand it they know these terms they know these these uh terminologies they know these uh mannerisms they know the mindset so they can break it down for you at a higher pace or a higher level than you could as just an average player yep totally agree and definitely um people hearing things in a different way definitely helps and like being able to ask questions is a huge thing you know the, the content creators like don't really they, 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 they would, they will sit there and like answer questions, but at the end of the day, it's like that one-on-one, -on -one, like you were saying, that really like, like helps you move at like a faster pace. I know not everyone has all the time in the world to sit there and watch every single video and then not gain the same information that they would have gone through like getting coached. Yeah. It's also through intent too. Cause like, let's say, let's just take you for example. Uh, you're a competitive player. It's not like you're coaching because you're done playing. You coach because you're very good at the game and you know, you want other people to get as good as you, if not better. But there's things that if I were to just run into you at an event and I'm talking to you one on one, you may not explain your deck choices. You may not explain to me your your tech cards. You may not explain to me your lines of play because obviously I'm a competitor. You don't want me. You want to do better than me. You want to be the best. There's only one winner in, in at these events. You know what I'm saying? Whereas yeah, and 
if you're getting a coach, they they want your growth. So they're going to tell you these things. They're going to tell you, yo, don't play like that. Play like this. You're 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 playing into nib when you do this. You're not playing around Ash or uh, Shifter at this point you're, or Droll. You know what I'm saying? Like they're they don't want you to get better. They they'll sure they'll talk to you or whatever like that. I'm not, I'm not sure they they want to be like mean to you, but they're also not caring about if you digest the information or not. A coach or someone like that is going to be more inclined or more attached to your benefit like if you're doing good you know what i'm saying so like i think that that intent is also very very big when it comes to it some players don't want other players to get good where other players all they want is for their players to get good yeah so I totally agree if you if you had because i'm just curious now if you had the choice between only playing Yu Gi Oh, whether it be competitive or you're not as competitive and then never coaching again, so never being able to take another player under your wing, or coaching any player you want, you know, your choice or whatever, for as long as you want, but you yourself could never any any competitive you yourself could never enter any competitive tournaments. What do you what do you think you would more lean towards if you had to, an option of the two? That's a tough one. Honestly, my love for you for playing Yu-Gi-Oh is too strong. I'd have to choose that. But that's definitely tough because you know, I do enjoy both. But if I had to choose not playing Yu-Gi-Oh sounds very upsetting, <laughs> like ever again. You know, what I mean, like you know, I, yeah, that's I, I can agree with that. I, I feel as though even though, no matter how much I could teach someone and like they could get good at Yu-Gi-Oh, it's it's different when you do it yourself. You know, yeah, when you're proving to yourself that I am the best, or I know the best, or I I have the the best um, mentality when it comes to it. Like you can coach anyone all day let's say jesse cotton can go pick up any guy from the street and you know turn him into a champion but like it's different when you're the one doing it compared to your um intern or your uh mentor you know sorry your uh yeah you know your mentor doing it versus you yeah a student yeah yeah so yeah that's kind of that's kind of you know interesting i definitely i think i i would be completely cool with coaching for the rest of my life not to say i don't like playing the game or you know would never want to play the game but I, I think I find personally more joy and happiness allowing others to get good. Like when I see someone, for example, uh, not to you know tease them or shout them out, but my boy Daryl Rupert, so shout out to Daryl Rupert. Uh, he was a local guy who didn't really care about playing the best decks, I would say. He just wanted to have fun. He would come to locals, he'd throw his $5, he'd go X2, he'd go home, and you know he had a smile on his face. And something about him, something within the last couple of months just clicked with him. Where he's like, I just want to get good. I want to get better. And so he would find deck profiles or like people who were topping with his deck and try to make it the best of his ability. Try to like, he would be um, asking all of us for like uh, options as far as like helping him deck build, uh, lines of play, what are good cards in the format, what are good staples uh, to side and stuff like that. He just naturally started to get a little bit more curious about the game. And he eventually got to where he went to the regional at Rochester. So shout out to Millennium Games. And he got his invite. He got 25th place. And I was utterly flabbergasted how this guy who can go from not topping the locals to, to place the work. event had, three, had three, 300 plus people. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, that, to me, I think would bring me more joy than if I myself were to have won that event. You know what I'm saying? Not to say that it takes yeah. anything no, away. No, I mean, but that's seeing how it was for, for me when good. Ruben won. Like, when Ruben won the YCS, that's how it was for me. Like, seeing him win was just, like, a better feeling than recently when I won. So, it's... It's, exactly. I get it. So, so it's definitely a tough choice for sure. I, I can tell you that. <laughs> I agree. Definitely a tough choice. But uh, get, closing into the episode, because I know we're uh, running out of time here, and I know I appreciate all the time you've, you've taken uh, hanging out with us and chit-chatting today, but we're going to get into the last segment of today's episode, which is basically just the people's choice questions. When we have big guests on, I go into the Discord, which you guys can all join by going into that link tree link down below and clicking on that link, hitting the Discord button, and then joining the server. Uh, but I always put up what's called our people's choice section. And that's where we allow people who are just the typical everyday players to uh, ask questions to our guests and get their questions that they might have answered. Uh, so that way they can understand a little bit more about the mindset of these uh, other players. So we have three uh, questions from today's uh, pool. All of them are chose to remain anonymous, which is no big deal. Uh, but the first question is, uh, what is your favorite pet deck meaning a deck that you know is absolutely abysmal but you still will play with or keep up on it because you enjoy it um 
T like I'm gonna get a lot of hate for this, but tier. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. You're you were a tier player. Get the most. I love tier. Um I don't it's think pretty it's pretty down the middle with that though. It's it's like it yeah, really the is. people who at the end it, of the day, like yeah. They're gonna play it no matter what. But I mean I wouldn't play it this format, but that's just my opinion. I mean, and I love the deck too, so it's actually like it says a lot more than you know, just anyone saying like, oh, like tier is like not like good, but I mean, you know. It once was. It was probably the the strongest deck, I think, the best deck if not of all one time. of the strongest decks of all time. Yeah, of all Yu-Gi-Oh history. Probably up there with uh, Zodiac. You know, say prime yeah. time Zodiac, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and then we have another uh, question from another anonymous duelist. He uh, says, or they say, what are some uh, player tips someone could do to try and improve for higher level play like YCSs? Um... Definitely uh, being open to playing remote duel. I gotta be real. Like playing remote duel, like with your friends, uh, if like, Ooh, you can't like for, for somebody, like that definitely has helped. Like in certain like like times, like um like me and Polly like prep for like the his first remote duel and like um I know he was testing with other people as well, but we we, we tested for like twelve hours straight at like one a.m. So like stuff like that, like definitely um, go outside your comfort zone. Definitely don't be like scared to try something new. Um, even if it's like not like even if it's against the norm, like other people might hate on it, but like you know, I enjoy it and I definitely think it helps. Mm. That's crazy. I actually like that. That's a hot take because I know a lot of people uh, think that um, remote duels aren't quite, let's just say, quote unquote, real enough. Like, so, let's just say if someone got a remote duel top, it's not as um, it doesn't carry as much weight as an in person top, and. I somewhat I want to feelings wise agree with that, but the logical sense of me says no. This is still an event. This is still a big ass tournament. You're still people playing still play. all the pro day. Players still yeah, play. exactly. You're still playing the pros. Like, you know what I'm saying? You're still playing good people. <laughs> so yeah, you may be playing from the comfort of your house, but you're still putting in that time, that effort, uh, and all the um, work and effort required for playing a big tournament in general you're just doing it from the comfort of your living room so yeah that's actually a hot take i actually like that one i, I personally am one of those people who don't like remote duels personally so i can uh, i can see that that from would be side, something yeah. that i would probably take yeah from the other side i definitely can see that uh, that standpoint and then uh the last question we have from our anonymous duelist uh looks like it would be how does it feel to have your record of most YCS wins finally tied by Jesse Cotton? Good or bad? Um, definitely a good feeling. Uh, I mean, I want to see Jesse do well, and like it definitely, like I said, it motivated me a lot. So I needed that. Like you know, sometimes you just get comfortable, but you know, it's a whole different mindset now going into the next event. You know, I mean, like even taking one event off, like I've already I've only been thinking about Yu-Gi-Oh like ever since then. Like you know, it's, it just doesn't stop. I know you're probably a little bit biased. Who do you think will get it first? I don't know. I, I'm just saying I'm ready. Not like skill wise, but like thinking about preparations for events, what events you're able to go to. Um, you know what I'm saying? I like, think I think I have a good chance in Europe. Um, I mean, I've won one European event. I've only been to three, and then I've topped one. So I have a good chance in Europe. I feel like, and I definitely like the atmosphere in Europe more. So I feel like, um, but he's also won in Europe. So like, you know, we both have good chances. But I you know I feel like I'm a little really motivated right now. So. Do you think that, and the last question I'll personally ask you, do you think that it's a, a major difference between European events and North American events? I know that North America is looked at as the quote unquote more competitive, but you know. I think we have the best players, but I think Europe, Europe has a better uh, like average player base, like definitely 100%. Um, yeah, the bell and, but I think the, the US players are definitely like like up, uh, up on the top of the list of like the best players in the game. But then again, like that's just me being, uh, when, when, I don't want to say biased, but that's just me like going from like the results and like seeing what I've seen over time without like like trying to be biased like in itself. No, I I want us to be the, yeah, exactly. Like so, it's but also we have like most recent world champion. Like we win most of the YCSs. Like I like we go to Europe and like we win a YCS. You know, it's 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 it just kind of speaks for itself that like you know we represent. But also like Europe is very strong like in itself, and I respect them a lot as players community even the streaming community is great like it's great atmosphere you know because they got players like joshua smith uh ness is oh, yeah. all out there like you know what i'm saying they got so they got noble players but here in america we do it big yeah we got you know what i'm saying yeah. <laughs> so 
I appreciate you for coming out here. Sadly, we are running out of life points, coming close to an end. Uh, I do definitely want us to give a huge thanks to our guest, uh, Chris LeBlanc, for coming out here and sharing his time and his thoughts and his intuition on the game and as well as his perspectives. Uh, so before we close out, I just want to give a reminder to all the listeners out there to go, please go down to the link tree link down below. Hit that description. All right. Go down to the link tree link in the description box below and click it so that way you can follow all of our sites. And just remember, we'll be doing giveaways on all of those sites. So just be sure to follow when it hits a certain number, we're just gonna give you shit. It's really not that hard. So be sure to uh, do all those. Also, be sure to go check our sponsors Discord server down there, Unplugged Gaming in Manly, New York. You can go down there, click to be a part of that Discord server, and then hop into whatever game you want to play. The communities are already there. They have trade sections, talk sections, competitive talk sections. Uh, whatever you guys need, they have it in their Discord as well. So if you go to the store, also in Manliest, New York, you can be sure to tell Joe, the owner, that the boys over at Semi Limited sent you, and they'll be sure to hook you up. And last but not least, if you guys are Twitch stream watchers, be sure to check out Brad, AKA Mr. Perfect, live streaming every Saturday night at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Twitch. He usually goes over deck profiles. He'll be doing uh, uh, deck theory, deck testing, uh, hanging out with his uh, chats. He's very, very interactive and a cool dude. I might be in there uh, chit-chatting with him, maybe commentating over some shit. So you never quite know what'll happen. And all the things that happen on his highlight reels always make it over to the podcast we talked about on the Wrap It Up Friday. So be sure to go ch check in out his streams as well. And uh, one more time, a special uh, thanks to our guests for coming out. Do you have any other shout outs? Do you want to uh, bring anything up? Any plugins or anything like that one last time? Uh, no, I think that's it. Uh, thank you for having me on. Yeah, well, any, any final thoughts on the show? Uh, any topics or like that or anything? No, I mean, I, I think head? everything everything went smooth. Definitely got me motivated to go play some more Yu-Gi-Oh. I know I got some coaching to do now, but I'm definitely going to play some Yu-Gi-Oh after that all night, you know, for my trip to Germany. Um, definitely like talking about Yu-Gi-Oh, so this is a pleasure. But with that being said, guys, we are officially all out of life points. Make sure to tune in for the next episode. I am Player X, and we are the Semi-Limited Podcast. Thank you, and good night.